we now are going to consider uh, other information, particularly what I refer to as sample history. And this implies that you know something about your sample uh, that you run in an NMR spectrum. It's actually quite rare that you have a complete and total unknown. If you're a synthetic chemist, you know what, what you were trying to make, and you're trying to confirm whether you actually did make it or not. You're, you may be trying to confirm the purity or the structure of a molecule in a bottle that has a label on it, but you want to make sure what's in the bottle is actually what's on the label. You may have synthesized this and already uh, other measured its molecular weight using something like mass spectrometry. And so you often know something, in fact, sometimes quite a bit, about the history of the sample that you're trying to run. And we're going to make use of that and help us interpret NMR spectra. In particular, you very often will have information on the chemical formula and the molecular weight. As I said, either because you know the structure you're trying to make or you've already measured these things. If you know the molecular weight and the formula, especially if you know the formula, there is one very useful tool that you may have seen in your past that's quite handy in figuring out structure, especially interpreting NMR spectra. And it's called the index of unsaturations. Remember, unsaturations, the number of pi bonds or rings or combinations of those two in our structure. It has a fairly simple formula. The index is simply the number of carbon atoms in that formula plus one minus one half the number of hydrogens plus, I use X here for the number of halogens, a fluorine, a chlorine, a bromine, or an iodine, minus the number of nitrogens. And that will cover a tremendous number of possible formulas that you might encounter. For example, C6H14. This would be the formula of hexane. One, two, three, four, five, six. A linear structure, no pi bonds, no rings, it should have zero unsaturations in it. And if you apply the formula here, number of carbons is 6 plus 1 minus half the number of hydrogens, which is 14, plus the number of halogens plus the, minus the number of nitrogens, zero. So if I mess up the formula, so what? 7 minus half of 14 is 7 equals zero. Index of unsaturation, zero. If you have C6H12, that would be the formula of cyclohexane. Remember, that's not benzene, that's cyclohexane. You would have an index of unsaturations. Again, 6 plus 1 minus half the number of hydrogens, which in this case is 12. That's going to come out to be 7 minus 6 equals 1. And there it is, 1 unsaturation. The ultimate, of course, is benzene. Remember, benzene, six-member ring with the alternating double bonds formula is C6H6, a little bit of six there, C6H6. If you calculate the index of unsaturations here, six plus one minus half the number of hydrogens, which in this case is only six, and the rest of it is zero, we have seven minus three equals four, four unsaturations, and sure enough, three pi bonds, and the ring itself, giving the fourth unsaturation. If you have information about the chemical formula uh, and you're measuring NMR spectra, a high number of unsaturations like this, four or five or six, very often is associated with an aromatic molecule. And NMR, of course, makes that really easy to confirm. Look at your proton spectra. Any signals around seven or above ppm? In your carbon spectra, any carbons around 120 or higher uh, ppm. Those are both the signatures of aromatic molecules in, in your proton and carbon NMR spectra. Now I want to show you two sets of NMR spectra, both from molecules we've seen before. One, our dear friend, the standard methyl ketone. The other is going to be 3-pentanone. Now, 
we know what the structures of these things are, so we know the formulas and we know the molecular weights. But what I want to show you is how we can connect that information with the NMR spectra and also use the NMR spectra to sometimes derive or confirm the molecular weight and or the chemical formula itself. So first, take a look at the proton spectrum of methyl ethyl ketone. Now, when you look at that proton spectrum, you should notice that in the hydrogen spectrum, this is what I tend to look for when I first examine an NMR spectrum, either of a known or an unknown, as I start taking an inventory of my pieces. In the hydrogen spectra, I see three groups. Okay. Three groups of hydrogens, and they seem to be integrating three to three to two. I seem to have then the CH3 group. Now at one ppm, that's kind of a, at the end of a chain, and that's away. Away from anything interesting in that molecule. It kind of seems to be at the end of the molecule. I have a CH3 at around two ppm. Now, 2 ppm isn't a hugely distinctive region. There's a lot of stuff there, but this is an indication that this methyl group is closer to something a little more interesting than the first. And I also have a CH2 group. And this is at 2.4 ppm or so, which, again, is not distinctive up around 4 or any position higher, but it is an indication it's around something fairly interesting. If you then go to the carbon spectrum, and examine the carbon spectrum, you will notice that there are four distinct carbons. Now, three of them we already had a pretty good idea about when we examined the proton spectrum. The fourth one is interesting. It has an extremely distinctive chemical shift. It's up above 200 ppm. That is almost certainly a ketone carbonyl. Okay, this one is at 210 or so ppm, above 200 ketone carbonyl. And so with four distinct carbons in there, we can tentatively write a formula as C4. With one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight hydrogens accounted for, we could tentatively write that. Earlier, I mentioned you know, a couple of modules ago that there is no easy way in NMR to directly detect oxygen. There are no oxygen isotopes that are readily usable in NMR. But I did say you can often detect its effects on other things, and here it is. We have the chemical shift of a carbonyl, of a ketone carbonyl, which is not necessarily direct evidence of the oxygen, as we haven't measured it directly, but we are quite certain that it's there. And this gives us this tentative formula, C4H8O, which does match the chemical formula of methyl ethyl ketone of C4H8O. It also, if I were to add this up, would add up to a molecular weight, 72 grams per mole, which indeed is the molecular weight of methyl ethyl ketone. So I have very nice spectroscopic evidence from my NMR spectra that points directly to exactly this formula and that molecular weight. Very clear evidence that this sample is indeed methyl ethyl ketone. Very little question about that. The other one I want you to take a careful look at is 3-pentanone. Here is its structure, formula, and molecular weight. Now, take a careful look at its proton NMR spectrum. And these are the only interesting peaks in the proton NMR. Yes, there is a residual solvent signal down around 7.26 ppm, 
That, of course, being residual solvent, we don't need to worry about it. The point I want to make is you'll notice when you look at it, you see two groups. Two groups of hydrogens. And they, see, they seem to be integrating three to two. We see a CH3 at around 1 ppm. Once again, kind of away from anything terribly interesting. We see a CH2 group okay, at 2.2 or 2.3 ppm. A little bit closer to something interesting, perhaps. But that's all we see. Only five protons and only two of the carbons. If you examine the carbon spectrum, you see three distinct carbons. Once again, we see two carbons that we've already seem to have accounted for. And then that very distinct chemical shift above 200 ppm. We certainly have, you know, two carbons, actually three carbons, and then one of them is definitely a ketone carbonyl again. If we put that information together, we seem to have a chemical formula that would be C3H5O, which does not match the formula. If you added that up, it would add up to, I think, 57 grams per mole. It does not produce the expected molecular weight. We're missing stuff here. The NMR spectra gives us this kind of information, our sample history, knowing its formula or its molecular weight or what we think that sample is, it contradicts that. Whenever we have a situation like this, where the NMR spectra is, seems to be missing pieces, there's a couple of reasons for that. One, your sample may not really be three pentanone, or you could be looking at symmetry. And indeed, we've looked at the symmetry of this molecule in a previous module. And that is exactly what's happening here. The way you kind of pick up that you have symmetry in a molecule is if the sample history, the formula, the molecular weight, or the potential structure indicate a larger molecule than you measure, but it is symmetric, you are going to end up in a situation like this. Interestingly enough, looking at C3H5O, there are actually two possible structures that could match this information. One of them is, indeed, 3-pentanone. But the other one would be that diketone. They would both produce two carbons symmetric that have hydrogens, a CH3 and CH2, the CH3s would be at the end of a chain and kind of down around one. It would produce a carbonyl carbon consistent with a ketone. And so it's interesting that by the NMR spectra itself, you would have these two potential structures only if you knew the formula, the compound you're trying to make, or its molecular weight could you distinguish between these two readily. There is another source of information that sometimes students will forget about, and that is their knowledge of organic chemistry. You look at this diketone and you realize that's a little bit of an odd structure. Um, we don't see carbonyls next to each other like this very often. One reason is the, that the you know, slightly positive nature of the carbonyls makes bonding them together a little bit unusual. It's not unheard of, certainly not impossible. But it does, if you know, most organic students would look at those two structures and just kind of intuitively feel that this one is possibly the most likely one. And indeed, your previous experience is also a good source of information about helping you interpret NMR spectra.